Hey, this is Elon from Eggard Watch Company. For a while, I've been trying to find ways to use my platform, my company, to spread positive messages of masculinity, and I've started bringing people on and interviewing them who work in that space. And today, I have an awesome guest. His name is Jordan Fultz, and I'm really excited to introduce him to you. Thanks. Good to talk to you. Really good to talk to you. I'm, I'm, this is exciting. Um, so I worked for four years as the director of an organization that was uh, that specifically had the mission of offering rites of passage and mentoring um, to teenage boys, um, essentially to support teenage boys on their paths to becoming men of integrity. And it's a mission that's very near and dear to me. And I think uh, probably to most men who take the time to, to consider what their own teenage years were like, I think for most of us, we find a way to initiate ourselves whether or not there's a group of men there or a particular man there to, to bring us through a formal initiation. Um, for me personally, um, when I was about 15 or 16, I started to feel a little bit awkward and a little bit kind of um, ostracized from my friend group and things were changing and my ideas were shifting, my identity was shifting and I didn't really have a play that my parents didn't know who I was anymore. My friends didn't know who I was and I needed something. I needed to push back against something. And for me, I found that initiation in the woods. And so I would take myself out into the woods for hikes and for camping. And then I would continue to push the limits more and more, um, kind of pushing up against my fear, what my boundaries were, my comfort boundaries were in that process. First, it was a, a night alone in the woods, then it was two nights, and it was in the winter time. And then, um, you know, it kind of culminated in that period for me with hiking. Uh, the long trail of Vermont, where where I grew up, which is a 270 mile trail that runs the entire length of the state. Those are common elements of any rites of passage of any, of any initiation is putting oneself into um, situations that are dangerous, uh, unfamiliar, and where one needs to turn to parts of themselves that they might not have previously had access to or even known about to rise up to the occasion and meet the situation at hand. I just wanna make it clear to everyone what a rites of passage is because you were starting to touch on it. Uh, and I think if you could just get in more detail. Yeah, well, there's a lot to that, um, to that uh, question, but rites of passage, um, a rite of passage is a, is a process um, a ritual process, so a staged, intentional, artificial process since the dawn of civilization have, um, have orchestrated uh, for transition periods in life. And the one that I'm talking about and the rite of passage period that we're focusing on is the teenage years. And that, I think, to me, is the most foundational, foundational and important rite of passage. And it's one that you will find examples of cross-culturally speaking on every continent and just about every culture for boys in particular during their teenage years, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, as, a, um, as an experience, a ritual, and a series of tests that they were against their will usually um, brought to by elder men of the society to initiate them to bring them through a threshold to bring them out of the world of boys and children and into the world of men so a ritual a rite of passage from boyhood to manhood it needs to be intentional it needs to be artificial versus just a natural transition if if uh if it were left up to children for example very rarely would they naturally choose uh, uncomfortable situations to self-actualize themselves, you know, which are what rites of passage naturally offer. So, you know, when we talk about it, when you and I are talking about it, and I think for the purpose of this conversation, um, we're talking about rites of passage for boys, adolescent boys um, at, at, during their teenage years to bring them from the world of boys and children into the world of men. Do you think that there's fundamentally a, a different need for boys and girls to have a rite of passage. In other words, often when I hear or I think of a rite of passage, I do think about it in terms of a boy becoming a man. And I think that there is some action, or like you said, some staged event that takes place, uh, something that's lost today in modern culture, and we'll touch on that later. But do you, do you think that there's actually a necessity for boys versus women? There's some kind of difference there that, that kind of justifies our conversation making this entirely about boys. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, you know, there is, there is. And for one, you know, I speak from the male perspective and I've worked, I've done this work for boys specifically. And there are people out there and organizations out there that try to do, uh, or that I don't say try, want to say try to do and diminish what they're doing, but who offer rites of passage for girls. However, when you look at it from a lineage standpoint, when you look at it from a cross-cultural lineage uh, standpoint, rites of passage nearly universally, ubiquitously, almost universally, I think you can find some exceptions, but very nearly universally, were offered and presented and um, orchestrated specifically for boys and not necessarily for girls at all. And that raises a lot of questions in, um, in anthropologists and ethnographers and even psychologists like inquiries about why, why was this why was this a specific thing for boys? Why is the transition of getting from boyhood to manhood something specific and unique? And what we find when we look at this, why, why is it that rites of passage were, were more ubiquitous or more common or more universal in the realm of males and boys? What, what, what you also find, culturally speaking, is that the concept of manhood, cross-culturally speaking, is almost always something that must be st- striven for, something that effort must be applied to achieve, something that will not necessarily just incidentally happen as you mature biologically. So you find this cross-cultural concept that if you were to leave a boy to his own physical biological maturation, he wouldn't necessarily be a man. And that certain processes and efforts and, and artifice must be applied to him he must kind of be tempered. He must be fired in the kiln, you know, so to speak, or tempered like a sword. Things must be done. Things must be offered to him. He has to do certain things to achieve manhood. And it's not even over then. He must continue to renew his kind of contract as a man throughout his life. In terms of just the basic responsibility of a boy becoming a man from a biological standpoint, let's say, there's not the same responsibility as when a a girl becomes a female there's an inherent you know she can get pregnant which is a huge difference for men there's this unbelievable change that happens in your body that makes you stronger makes you have more drive you get tons of testosterone all of a sudden your body changes dramatically if you look at the physical differences between a boy's body just in terms of stature you know they go from being four feet tall to being six feet tall you don't see that physical change as much in a girl becoming a woman in terms of the difference in terms of size. So men become extremely powerful out of nowhere. Um, I see it in my niece and nephew. They're they're the same size. And then he's hitting puberty now. She's already hit puberty. And he's just becoming giant compared to her. And more often than not, there's this physical element to it. And men suddenly have all all this energy and everything. And they don't have an outlet necessarily. Yeah, there's an element of your physicality changing. But being a man is taking all that physicality and then putting it to good use and being responsible for it. Something lost in society today. I don't know if you want to touch on that. (laughs) Yeah, well, it is very, yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously lost in society today. But what I think is really telling is that regardless of the fact that we've, 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 um, um, left it to the wayside or let it drop, you know, um, with many traditions of our ancestors, we've let rites of passage drop, regardless of the fact that an intentional artificial, you want to call it contrived rite of passage is no longer a thing in our society. There's still very many examples of, of that sort of thing existing or boys trying to create that experience for themselves. You know, I started with my thing about going into the woods. I look back on that time in my life, now, after having done this work and having thought about it for, for so much, you know, invested so much effort into it, and I'm like, oh, I was, I was initiating myself. Yeah. Why did I have to keep going back to the woods when I was terrified? Why did I have to go back in sub-zero temperatures? Why did I have to go back and do 270 miles with a bum knee? Why did I have to keep pushing the limits? Because it was about pushing into the unknown, specifically in a territory where I could not be protected by my parents. I wanted, I craved, and I needed that exposure. And you find it sending a boy off to boarding school in ninth grade or to military uh, ROTC military school. That's an example of a rite of passage. We don't call that a rite of passage, 
but people do that because they are confronting a new uh, person arising or growing within their son that they no longer have the tools to reckon with as parents. So they send him off to a school where he will be initiated by his peers and by systems that are usually um, more uh, stringent and challenging to him, be that through a military structure or a headmaster or academics or certain male mentors will, will be challenging him out of the protection of the parents, out of the parental home, into that, uh, into that experience and into manhood in a boarding school type situation. Um, you, gang, gang initiation, exactly. that's, that's what they're hungering for. There's a you know 33 year old or 27 year old gang leader who is this big brother figure, and you get these 14, 15 year old kids who think he's the world, and he's 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 offering this uh, this experience of of hierarchy where they can live into this this uh, this growth into the into manhood through an initiation, and very often those initiations also uh, carry with them some sort of d- danger um, yeah. or challenge or uh, uh, exposure outside of the parental home. Those are critical and cross-cultural elements that all rites of passage need to have the danger. And you can't be under the auspices of your parents to have it. That's a key psychological element that needs to happen. That's really important in this process. So yeah, we don't have it, but we still find ways to actuate that in our lives. Not everybody, but it's part, it's written into our, it's written into our psychogenetic code to yeah. to seek those kinds of experiences out no we we had talked about it previously you and i about the gang uh active like if if you live in a rough neighborhood i was i've lived in you know certain neighborhoods that were a little rougher and i saw it happening firsthand when there was no father figure around there was no positive male role model and yeah. then it would hit these years where he wanted to validate himself and the outlet and it is a very i can understand the appeal from their perspective because they belong they become a man and they are searching for it. And I think that's, like you said, there's some kind of inherent need for it and we will create it for ourselves. And it won't always be positive if we don't have something in society built in that says, when you get to this age, you do this, it's gonna be tough, but it's gonna make you a man. And I think it would have a massive change on numerous uh, issues in society if we did stringently have something like that. In terms of the consequence of how we don't anymore. Do you feel like there are societal consequences that we've kind of dropped this concept? And even when we do implement it, we don't implement it in the way that you necessarily said. It's more lax nowadays. Like we've previously spoken about a bar mitzvah <laughs> where you become a man. There's no true consequence if you, you, know, you don't do a great job at it. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on the consequence of societies now, especially Western societies that are dropping this kind of inherent uh, need to turn a boy into a man at a certain point. Yeah, man, there's so many, there's so many consequences. I think that any societal ill, honestly, that that we can kind of illuminate or draw or or observe in today's culture, whether or not it's, it's exclusively traceable to this kind of a thing, everything can be traced to this, but you know, ones that I want to, that I want to focus on, I guess, um, I think that that there are two which um, which I find to be critical and important, and one is uh, responsibility. And what I see happening um, in in Western society today, and I'm a millennial, um, I'm 35, and I think it's it's ta- it's it's taken a giant leap with my generation. Is this turning away from taking responsibility for your own life and seeing that as a path to empowerment, freedom, and self-actualization. And what I see a lot in my peer groups and my friend groups and with the young adults today is a tendency to, to position responsibility and personal agency as a burden and as something that's oppressive rather than something that is the, the key to their own empowerment and self-actualization. Responsibility can be a burden. Yes, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard to, 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 to take um, full accountability and responsibility for one's life, to make decisions on the day-to-day, to provide for one's family, to stand up against the oppressively difficult world 
that we all live in and that's part of being born into a physical body. What I see happening with my generation is um, not only a, there, and many people are ill-equipped to do yeah. that. You find an extended period of dependency on the parental units. And I think part of that is shifting economic circumstances. Like I think, you know, we can, we, I don't want to get into that, but I think much more of it is a psycho spiritual issue where young adults are not seeking their own, uh, you know, expression and seeking their own destiny and willing to take the risks of being exposed um, in that process in the world. That's a, that's, that's responsibility. Now, with rites of passage, one of the key things, again, was to shift the world of the boy to the world of the man. And the idea of freedom shifts completely when you make that transition. So we all can reflect back onto our childhood years and having free imagination and free play and we're running, we're running freely and, and it's all full of joy and playfulness and magic. It's this period of incubation where we don't have to take any responsibility for ourselves. And so there's this certain level of freedom that we have to imagine and run around and just be yeah. completely irresponsible. That's a certain type of freedom, but that's not the same type of freedom that someone needs to pursue and cultivate in their adult years. That freedom is only possible through absolute dependency and yes. absolute shelter on a, on a parental unit. So you don't have to worry about what pants you're putting on. You don't have to worry about whether you're drinking water, somebody's putting a water bottle on your face when you need it. They're, you know, literally wiping your butt, you know, like, yeah. like it's, it's, it's complete dependency. And the exchange is you get imaginative, irresponsible freedom. The flip that rites of passage have always sought to cultivate and create in, in individuals is that you start to see and relate to freedom as the more res I need to take responsibility for myself so that I can achieve agency over my life and independency from uh, the parental unit primarily, but um, you know other other structures that I would be otherwise be leaning on to gain freedom through having more and more responsibility rather than less and less. If you take a child and subject it to the type of freedom that and that serves that is life giving to an adult then it's an abusive situation if you make them work for their own living if you, <laughs> you know, like whatever it is it's the same for an adult if you take an adult and you say okay you're free go go have a childhood type of freedom we're going to feed you your meals you're going to eat what we tell you to do you're going to drink water when we tell you to do you're going to wear the clothes that we tell you to you can go out only when i say so you got a curfew but you're free to imagine you don't have any responsibility that's oppressive that's no longer freedom in the adult world so a key part of the rites of passage was to flip to invert a re individual's relationship and how they define and pursued freedom from one that was free of responsibility to one that increased in proportion to the responsibility that they took in their life. And having domain over one's life isn't all beautiful. It sucks. I mean, when you fall on your face, it, it's, it's hard. Yeah. But also courage to face the unknown and to be exposed in the world and to face one's fears and to face dangerous situations. Um, and from a male perspective, that's part of what's always given men purpose throughout time is the, is the ability to stand in the face of fear to stand in situations that 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 they were afraid of and to find a way through and then become stronger and more self-actualized through that process. Today, we're encouraged to shirk away from exposure, from danger, from, and I'm not just talking physical danger, I'm talking new situations, I'm talking risk, yeah. any kind of risk, you know? Um, and I do think that when we turn our backs on responsibility and courage and then give a free path to cowardice and let's say irresponsibility or dependence we we can create some pretty um some pretty we we we, we generally end up passing um we create structures that can be totalitarian let's well, say we, yeah we see it in society i mean what you're saying about shifting from a state of independence to dependence under the guise of freedom, under the guise of protecting you, under the guise of providing for you, under this idealistic myth that the world is a better place when everything is done for you. Exactly. It's extremely dangerous. And we see it in terms of, I see it in my own circles. I've seen it in 
in circles well beyond my own circles, just working in this space since I, I have been and uh, seeing the effects it's definitely had on on boys becoming men who've traditionally, if we're talking about gender roles, traditionally have been providers, have been the ones who gone out and fought and, and you know have been the ones running into the burning buildings and now we're telling everyone hey you know you don't have any responsibility anything that hurts your feelings feelings matter more than anything and we've kind of created a society I don't want to say that is weaker but I do want to say that it's impacted the empowerment or the uh, the kind of how people perceive themselves and what they're capable of and there's such a danger in taking that away from people, telling people you are not capable or that you don't need to be capable is one of the most dangerous things you can do to a society. And I've seen it really happen to boys. I fully agree. I don't think that freedom is perpetually this imaginary world where you're, it's beautiful, where you're free to do whatever you want. That flip is so necessary. And if it's not structured, if there's no time where it happens, you see people in their late thirties now still living at home, living with their parents, wanting wanting the everything provided for them whether it's from their parents or from the government from whatever outside source and they live in a state and i use this term very carefully but they almost live in a state of complete dependence and complete it's almost like a parasitic state where you're you need to be supplied for you cannot supply for yourself which is unbelievably dangerous uh, because what happens when that supply gets cut off you're incapable of being truly free which is being able to provide for yourself. That's how I would define true freedom. Having authority over oneself and being able to create for oneself and being able to, uh, to build things and being able, that's real freedom. It's so observable to see, in a, let's say in boys, I'd say in humans, it's so observable to see the purpose, happiness and fulfillment that somebody exhibits and experiences when they are empowered in their own capability. Yes versus being dependent and retracting from their own pursuing their own capability which takes risk and exposure it's just so it's so self-evident when to see a self-actualized person living in the world of exposure pursuing their and, de and developing their capability versus the 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 opposite you know um and with boys absolutely uh when they're plugged into that it's the adage of teaching a person to fish versus giving them fish, fish. yeah right that's that's rites of passage you know, and, and it's not, and it's not always a, uh, the thing that people don't, can't stomach is that rites of passage were not PC. They were not, they were not acceptable by today's standards of how you, how you treat people and what's appropriate to subject people to. I mean, they were, by today's standards, traditional rites of passage would be considered completely abusive. Um, but the wisdom, let's say of the ancients was that you had to you had to expose the adolescent boys to enough fear and even physical pain that they understood completely just what they were facing in the world of men and that they wouldn't shirk away from it because they said, I endured that. You know what? I can negotiate with my neighbor. That's not so bad. I, I was, I swam in shark infested waters or I was thrown <laughs> on a fire ant pile or I will, I will deal with this adverse, scary, exposed situation as a man because I realize that's the nature of life because I had this experience outside of the protection of my parents. When we don't have that experience, the illusion persists that we are, we are in a, in a sheltered state or that somebody should be sheltering us. Even yes. when we grow out from the parents home, we project that onto another, um, on another, uh, entity, you know? So. so something that's very important to me and I've touched on this, you know, in our conversations in the past is, um, the impact of fatherless homes on boys especially yeah. and how much society has shifted in recent years i believe we've gone from in uh the african-american community it went from a 25 percent 20 to 25 percent fatherless home to upward of 70 75 percent in the yeah. white community it went from five percent to 25 you're seeing like a five times increase consistently across most communities it's not a uh, a race specific thing it's you know it's it's a real epidemic that's targeting uh, most of Western civilization where fathers just aren't around as much as they used to be. And we're talking about rites of passage and the need for responsibility. And I feel like if that's not taught at an early age, or if actually the opposite is taught, then why would fathers stick around um, if they don't need to? <laughs> and so uh, I'm wondering, do you feel like there is some kind of connection between rites of passage and giving and telling boys that when they become men, they have responsibility and have to take authority over their lives and their choices? 
and the impact we're now seeing with fatherless homes. I mean, we can have a huge discussion over the impact of fatherless homes. Criminality, drug use, all violence. Everything all goes up. Yeah. Skyrocket. Um, if you find a teen, a homeless teen, and talk to them, 90 times out of 100, it's a fatherless home. So many things. But yeah, I mean, there, there are so many... Um, Yes, there's, there's, there's so many things that trace to that. And as you say, so I've been reading this book lately that's really taking a deep dive and an exploration into cross-cultural forms of masculinity and cross-cultural expressions of masculinity. And it's kind of an ethnographic in inquiry. And what is found is that there's so much in common, you know, as far as the fabric of masculinity, they call it a deep uh, a deep structure of masculinity that exists across cultures. Fathering children, providing for your children, are cross-culturally um, venerated pillars of masculinity, venerated pillars to the point where if somebody is not providing for their children in many different societies, uh, in many uh, diverse societies, they get the man card taken from them. They mm -hmm. get people whispering behind their back that that's not even, that's, he's not, he's not a real man. He's not a real man. You know, um, that, amount of societal reinforced societal pressure you could call it abusive you could call it superstitious you know by today's postmodern standards or whatever but it's look at what it did having that level of seriousness on one's obligation to provide for their families and be there for them to take care and provide for their children was so serious that it, one's very identity was linked to that we don't have that in today's culture i feel that way i mean i don't feel like i could ever turn my back on my kids that's just my own makeup fathers in the home are so important fathers um like psychologically speaking and as far as family structures mothers create safety they 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 ensure the physical safety of the children and pretty much they act out of i'm saying archetypally i'm saying yeah i'm saying the archetypal feminine energy is to act out of a place of protection primarily protection of the body um, protecting the body and physicality of the child. Masculine energy, if you want to think about it as solar and lunar, masculine energy is like the sun inviting the children to grow up and into their own strength and self-actualization through exposure. And traditionally speaking, fathers played that role. Mm -hmm. they, they were the ones rough, rough and tumbling with their kids. They were the ones taking them out camping. They were the ones taking them canoeing or hunting or... Um, into new experiences that usually had some element of unfamiliarity and danger to them. You know? Yeah, and there's a fear for, for a lot of men. I mean, I, I work with an organization that tries, that we spoke previously, tries to get across the entire United States and Canada, 50-50 assumption of at the time of divorce or separation, that there'd be a 50-50 custody just by default, short of some extenuating circumstance. And in, in many places, that's not the assumption not even legally. Society has somewhat social, social, socially engineered this, this kind of push toward lack of uh, fathers in the home. We've really kind of created narratives that men, initially we've we even told women that the man didn't need to be around. Uh, the government would, would take care of you if the man was not around. So it would take the role of the father. The government would take the role of the father. And people don't realize how dangerous that message is, but there's a direct correlation between a drop of fathers in the home and that um <clears throat> and uh you saw a whole shift just in terms of how we talk about masculinity nowadays how we talk about responsibility everything you're saying has really led to this i feel like most problems in society for boys could be heavily mitigated with a rites of passage that was kind of a standardized thing that really did test them and i feel we've gone in the opposite direction Touching on that, the reason we've gone in the opposite direction is just because the narrative around masculinity in general has drastically changed. In fact, a lot of the things you're talking about, a lot of the things, it's dangerous to even say these things nowadays. Uh, you're talking about um, you know, archetype, archetypal feminine energy, uh, which implies a biological standard for feminine energy. These are things that we've completely considered now offensive and have thrown away the idea that there is some kind of biological standard for masculinity that, that boys and girls are fundamentally different has become offensive to most of society and there are impacts on that because we've lost the meaning in my opinion of masculinity and what masculinity is and again even just saying that is dangerous nowadays so i'd love to hear your thoughts 
if you're comfortable on kind of, I want to say how the narrative around masculinity has changed, the impact that's had on boys. I think it drastically affects obviously why we don't do rites of passage anymore is because we've dropped this whole concept. So if you could just give your thoughts on the impacts. First, I guess, how masculinity has changed and then the effects that you feel it's had on society. Well, it's, you know, I think when it comes to these kinds of things, like <laughs> you have what people say and you have what people do. And um, I think that, that we're, I, I don't think, I know, I observe, we are encouraged um, through institutions of communications, um, such as media and academia primarily, I would say, um, and activists, ac different activist organizations to shun uh, masculinity and to shun the idea that there is an archetypal masculinity and an archetypal femininity that, that bears any um, truth to it. That's something that we should, that should be paid attention to and revered. In my opinion, part of the postmodern um, reality that we find ourselves in, part of postmodernism in general, is the, oblig the unsaid obligation to destroy any tradition without regard to whether the tradition exists out of truth or superstition. And so postmodern academia, postmodern media, the postmodern world, to be cool and hip in the postmodern world means you are taking an aggressive stance toward anything that's existed for a long period of time out of the assumption that it is oppressive or superstitious ra rather than the more obvious and likely assumption, which is that it served your ancestors since the dawn of time. And that's the reason that you're probably here and that people survived, you know? Um, I will say that, yeah, no, the narrative of masculinity, there's an active effort to diminish the narrative of masculinity and to diminish, um, uh, I guess to, to I, I don't know if it's diminished, but to, um, to malign masculinity, mm -hmm. to associate masculinity with uh, inherently ne negativity. Um, masculine means bad. And we all, we all hear the term toxic masculinity. You can't get away from it, you know? And I've said this in a couple interviews before. It's like when I was managing this, um, this organization uh, for teenage boys and, and mentoring them and directing them, I wanted to keep my finger on the pulse of what discussions were going on in society and in the world about masculinity so that I could bring fruitful and life-giving conversations to the group and help the boys talk about it in encouraging and empowering ways. So I had a Google alert set on my computer. Every week it would turn up the results. The, the Google alert was for masculinity. And 90 to 95% of the results were always about the, the damaging effects of masculinity or toxic masculinity specifically, or some group of men who were seeking to overcome the sordid and horrible history of masculinity. It was all positioned as though this was some horrible thing that we needed and had an obligation to overcome and throw in the dustbin of history. And so there's a very active effort and I, I'm, it comes from, uh, I'm pretty sure after having done research, it comes from gender studies departments at, at very powerful universities. And the inquiry that these departments take uh, toward masculinity is an, is an aggressive and a, uh, an antagonistic one. So if you go to any, I mean, you can pick your university, Duke, University of New York, um, you know, Wisconsin, pick, take your pick go to the gender studies uh, department and look at their, their course names. And in, unless you find a really out of the box situation, any mention of men or masculinity is an inherently, um, is, is, a, is a negative one, like male he hegemony. To look at male hegemony since the 1700s or like toxic masculinity in the era of blah, 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 blah. It's never like, archetypal inquiries into masculinity across cultures, you know, or like, um, yeah. or like a look into the warrior archetype. And there's a, uh, a priori assumption before the inquiries even led that masculinity bad, here's a course to prove it. And so academics have a lot of power. I mean, this is churning out people who write op-eds, people who write in journals, people who, you know, um, maintain positions in media, um, end up as directors of nonprofits, and put a lot of energy into crafting this narrative. And I think probably about, um, I'm not trying to be conspiratorial here. I mean, I, this is just what I see. It's not, I don't think it's like a conspiracy. It's just the way that our culture has gone. And um, I don't think anyone would disagree with you that there is 
a huge shift in the narrative stemming from universities and courses like gender studies, which have painted and them and them now, like you said, they go into positions of power and they continue that message forward. Yeah. I mean, it's not a secret. Uh, it's, no. I don't think it's a conspiracy. Yeah, no. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. So yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't think, and I don't know that there's any particular, I mean, what are the ends of this? What's, what's the purpose of this or what's the, what's the aim? You know, I've read, uh, I've read some ideas that kind of trace this sort of type of thinking to Marxist thinking. So the dialectic that Karl Marx, I don't want to get too political, but the dialectic that Karl Marx proposed was that history could be charted um, in terms of groups of people gaining power over other groups of people. And basically people's motivation and people's self-actualization had to do with their group standing and, um, and whatever cycle of oppression or victimization based on economic circumstance that they were yeah. experiencing. It took out of the equation any anything to do with nuanced family you know family structures like any other life-giving purpose that something might have other than an economic one so you take a group of people that didn't have stuff and then there's a group of people that does have stuff and then you can assume that every aspect of each of those groups of people were for the purpose of preserving the stuff or not preserving the stuff and so gender studies takes a look at masculinity and femininity or manhood and, and womanhood or what are abolishing all of them which is really where it's going, abolishing the whole yeah. thing from that lens of like, well, when we have these two things, it's, it's, it's always been for the purpose of one person having stuff and, or one group of people having stuff and one per, group of people not. And here's what I wanna get, I wanna get, make one more point here. It is, there's a monumental effort in the mainstream media and in academia to make traditional masculinity unfashionable and to get people afraid of pursuing that in themselves or cultivating that in themselves. There's a, there's a reward system. You can gain points in this, in this hierarchy of toxic masculinity by talking smack about masculinity. You can, you can say something negative and then you, then you gain points. So there's a lot of seduction into playing into this because on a mainstream societal fabric, if you are participating in the disparagement of masculinity, you gain status socially speaking in, in, in many social circles, I, I think probably more often than not. Look at Hollywood, um, by the way, sorry, just to interject. I mean, Matt Damon had to apologize for saying, can we just say there's a difference between, not to get into his message, but he just said, can we please say there's a difference between smacking a girl on, on the butt and rape? He said, they're not the same thing. So like, we, cause it was during the Me Too movement and actors were coming out, actresses and saying, well, I was smacked on the butt. I, I'm a Me Too victim, just like this rape victim. And so he was, he was like, there's a difference. You know, you're raped is very different than being smacked on the butt. We have to admit that there is some kind of spectrum here. Both can be wrong. One is far more wrong than the other one. One is far more uh, abusive and disgusting and terrible. And you know what I mean? We have a visceral yeah. kind of reaction to it. And that's all he said. And then he had to apologize because Hollywood went after him like crazy, all these women in Hollywood. And then he said, you know what, as a man, I shouldn't even have an opinion on this. That was his next interview. So I just there want to say go. that it's so. pervasive to the point of you can't even, as a left-leaning progressive celebrity, say there's a difference between being smacked on the butt and rape. That's how far it, it, it went. So, sorry, right. like, keep going. so here's the thing, though. In my opinion, at least so far, this effort's pretty new. This effort can be stemmed to second wave feminism. This is since the 1970s. You know, yeah. you get first wave feminism, which was about equal rights. Um, second wave feminism started getting just some straight out man hating stuff, like people writing, writing, journal, uh, writing in journals that the world, like let's envision a future without men. Um, but despite the really um, strong and successful social engineering efforts, branding efforts, these are efforts that take aim at the superficial, at the, at the, at the very superficial level of our consciousnesses and of, the, of, of what makes society move. So it takes aim at what we say, trying to govern what we say and how we speak. And it takes aim at our, how we present ourselves fashionably. But it has not successfully, in my opinion, made an impact on the archetypal structures that have governed us for millennia the deep structures of masculinity and the deep structures of femininity. Despite Hollywood's efforts, vast efforts to compensate for um, the natural allure of the hero's journey and the natural allure of a strong man overcoming adversity and helping people out, 
that is still the narrative that gets the blockbusters. That's still the narrative that appeals to young men who want to see themselves in that strong hero. You cannot put forth a self-shaming, self-hating uh, protagonist or hero of a story who's saying, I'm sorry for everything that he is and have it appeal to young men. Sorry, it's not going to happen. It's not economically viable. And yep. there's a huge effort. And the reason it's not economically viable is because it's not inspiring and it doesn't speak to the deep structures of who we are that have served us forever. You know, so I guess my point is, yeah, there is a narrative that's changing. And at the same time, Hollywood still has to serve and pay its dues to that deep structure that they know exists and that they haven't, that they really don't have any control over in the end. Because they won't um, be. Yes, of course. It's because there's some inherent, like you said, there's some inherent need for, for those kind of stories that will always exist. And if you want to survive as an industry, you're going to have to appeal to those. I think, we, I think we've gone on a long time. I mean, I hope people watched all the way through because you said some amazing stuff and uh, it was a real pleasure, man. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, if you like the, uh, the interview, please uh, like and subscribe and hopefully we can get more of these out there. Thanks so much.